Um, first, my thanks go to Coventry University and the Centre of Agroecology, Water and Resilience, who made this study possible. Um, I'm part of the centre. Um, my thanks go to Ulrich Schmutz, Julia Wright and Michel Pimer, who are also part of this. Um, I'm going to go through people and I'm going to introduce myself. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about research connected to a farm. And finally, I'm going to talk about the findings. So that's me. Um, Mexico is where I grew up as um, an adolescent. And that's where this environmental story for me really started because I got to travel a lot and I saw the beauty of the country but also I saw what uh, rampant treatment by humans was doing to it with lots of e erosion damage. And uh, I um, felt very sorry for that. And at that time, I didn't know this could become uh, a profession to try and remediate that. So first I went into the natural sciences. Um, and from there, um, in my profession, into healthcare where amongst other things I dealt with very um, uh, very constrained studies, clinical studies, where it is all about um, double-blind controlled um, studies, which is something that now hopefully is going to help me as well. I also realized that in healthcare, popping pills is not necessarily making humans healthy. So, um, during my work as editorial services, I um, wrote um, some things about um, environmental issues, and that's how I got to know about permaculture. That was in 2008. I met Zepp Holzer and uh, Holzer Permaculture, and I got a certificate with him on his farm. So um, at the end of it, I said I want to go back into research and look at the evidence behind the claims. So, I don't know. Now I got stuck. Sorry? Ah. So that's what really caught me. This is a, a project that was also presented uh, somewhere else. It, was, it is a landscape in the Antejo in Portugal, which, which was um, transformed from something very dry by retaining the water on the land and making something that to me looked like paradise. And that's what caught me. And I said, I want to know more about this. What is it? And I, I was told, well, this is permaculture. So that's how my, um, my journey started. And that's how I got infected by, by the permaculture virus. Um, as I mentioned, this is Zepp Holzer. You've seen pictures of his uh, farm earlier on. And um, he's a man who fights, he's very strong to get his ideas through. So I learned a lot from him. That's the group um, of about 30 people. And um, that's on the right when I became a translator to his courses in the US. Ah, I have to point it that way. Now, um, thanks to Rafter's work, Rafter S. Ferguson um, presented earlier. Um, I found this, uh, what, what, this question, what is permaculture's impact on the agroecological transition? So in, in my research, I want to I move beyond saying, well, permaculture stayed largely isolated from scientific research. I would like to contribute to, to make a change. And I'm seeing that there are a lot of others here who, who think the same way, which is great. So putting it in a picture, it's uh, about livelihoods. And um, a farm like this, um, a market like this one, which is very lively in Barcelona, but largely uh, selling produce from conventional farming. 
um, and I would like to see permaculture products on there instead. So the question is, how can we transform commercial farming systems, be it conventional, certified, organic or biodynamic, to permaculture systems and monitor the change in sustainability as well as resilience during that process and how does that again translate to livelihoods? Um, and that means eventually into money. Well, also what I'm interested in is uh, to see what impact does um, the building of water retention spaces um, do on the land, which is one of Zepholz's specialties, but also uh, other permaculturists. Um, so this is another building site. It's very invasive. And yeah, what's the worth of it? Um, I think it's pr pretty obvious, but uh, how can you put that into figures that are convincing? Now, my next question was when I started this research project in April this year. What is a useful research tool to do this? What are meaningful parameters? And how can I measure that? It's about measuring sustainability, measuring resilience. So I did a, an extensive literature search. Um, I'm just, I've written this, I'm not gonna read it out. Um, just to give you an idea, it's quite complex. There's a lot of liter literature written on um, sustainability assessment tools. And um, there are a lot of reviews. So I had to plow through all of this and at the end of it, I came up with something that seemed quite good to me. Um, so I chose a, um, a tool that would be about sustainability, that would measure sustainability along the food and agriculture value chains. That was, you know, important, not assess something else. Uh, I wanted it to be holistic, so it needed to be a global framework. It uh, needed to be somehow universal for small, medium and large scale companies or enterprises. And also it needed to be relevant to government strategies, policy and planning. So my idea is to build a bridge from a grassroots movement up to um, yeah, policy making. On a, on a country level, or on a continent level, or a world level. Yeah, and the last idea was this should allow for self-assessment so that everybody can do it. So what I came up with is the SAFA tool. It's the Sustainability Assessment for Food and Agriculture Systems. It's um, freely available. It was created by FAO. Um, it has four dimensions. Um, important for me, environmental integrity, economic resilience, and social well-being, which are then mapped uh, with permaculture, earth care, people care, and fair share. And just to give you an idea, it's 21 themes that it covers. Those are divided in 58 sub-themes and 116 indicators, so it's about 116 different questions. The whole tool works as an interview, kind of, um, yeah, you talk with the farmer or the farmer talks with himself. Just uh, to give you an idea what an indicator looks like, um, this is the indicator called e Ecosystem Enhancing Practices, E4.1.2. And what I liked about the SAFA tool is that a lot of uh, the indicators do um, cover uh, topics that are also topics in permaculture. So in this case, it was about agroforestry, mixed cropping, livestock system, mixed rice, fish systems, intercropping, perennials, forals, gardens. So all these topics are there and they are important at FAO level already. 
and they have developed a tool to assess that. Um, this is just to give you an idea what a, a data entry screen looks like. It's just an example for the topic of soil organic matter. And, um, well, for the farm I'm going to present in the next slides, I can say already that most of that, at least the way I assessed it, was um, in, in this very good or very good region. region. So this is what the result can look like. This is just an example. The actual result from the farm you will see later. Um, you see all the, the themes that are covered in this sort of polygon plot. And this is the farm I went to visit. I stayed there for two weeks. And um, as you can already see, uh, 10 minutes, yeah, great, yeah, should be possible. Um, it's a Demeter farm and it's also certified organic and um, really convinced that permaculture is the way to go forward. Just to give you an idea where it is, it is in uh, Spain in the Huelva province, so in the south where all those strawberries come from, you probably know. Um, but this is here not about strawberries. Um, so it's also not far from Gibraltar, which many of you will probably know. Um, the region is very dry and uh, with most rainfall in winter. They have an average rainfall of 470 millimeters and having said that, it has dropped a lot now. It has uh, uh, dropped by one quarter within uh, the last years. Um, Yeah, main produce is fruits or fruit trees, and we're talking about 50 hectares. Um, the farm is owned by a German person, Mr. Friedrich Lehmann. He's also owner of a big company that um, is it's a wholesaling company for organic produce based in Germany, and he owns this farm and a few others. So uh, the wholesaling company is like a holding. And um, yeah, it's one of the largest importers of organic produce in Europe. So thanks to Mr. Lehmann, I was able to assess this farm. Um, these pictures are just what is around that farm. It's olives and um, on naked earth and uh, I just happened to see that sign there on Explotación Agraria. So we want to move from the left-hand side to the right-hand side, which is uh, also olives on Gelanisol y Montebello, which is the name of the farm, or two farms put together. That's uh, the variety of crops they have. I'm not going to go into it in detail, so that covers the topic of biodiversity. There is a lot different ones, there's also some they are experimenting with, there's also some crops they just have for their staff to eat, which is also nice from the social perspective. Yeah, um, topography, um, now we have to say moving from biodynamic or organic certified to permaculture um, it's not starting from scratch so we have a farm that's also that's already running and productive and during the transition to permaculture to a permaculture system it needs to continue being productive so this key line design uh, is one part of the farm that uh, where um, trees were grown anew, so they could take this chance to grow, uh, to, to do it in key line design and uh, grow new trees. It's taken from a drone, so that's what it looks like. It's a uh, lichen pomegranate mixed. Um, again, transition, um, these were straight lines before, and it was important to break the wind tunnel because there's a lot of hot wind from Sahara 
So what uh, was done was quite clever by moving one tree uh, from here to there, closing that tunnel and still being able to go through the rows and harvest it. Um, this is the water bit, um, uh, water retention space that was built there. Um, the, the drawback is that actually rainfall dropped a lot and that's why it is reasonably dry. There's hedges about eight meters in um, three heights. So it's cassuaria, it's oleander, and then it's herbs underneath. You see this is the hedge and this is the conventional farm just on, on the other side. Um, it's about covering cover crops, green manure to uh, cover the soil. Um, here we have buttercup oxalis. We have also wild grains and uh, beans. About the soil, it's um, producing biofertilizer on the site and uh, to improve the microbiology of the soil. The microbiology itself is going to, it's not a direct nutrient, but it's going to make the nutrients available from the soil. So this is what uh, composting is working with, five minutes. I have to go a bit uh, faster. This is about crop biodiversity. They're trying to, starting to grow wild um, varieties of avocado, which you can see on the pictures. Uh, solar power is um, also being put on the farm. Uh, it's about creating habitats for wild biodiversity. Um, it's about pest control with natural methods. Here we have the ladybird larva, we have traps. And at the end of it, uh, this is what the um, polygon looks like. We have some very strong dents in there. That's not because they're so bad at that, but because the software system didn't allow me to switch off certain parameters that are not relevant for that particular farm. And part of the scores were a bit lower because there wasn't the, the actual documentation, the paperwork that would be there. So, what I can say as a result is um, produce quantity and quality as well as diversity went up within the course of five years. Soil quality and quantity went up as well. The water use was reduced by about 25%. The electricity cost to the site was reduced by 50% and no further investment was re required regarding staff. Now, that isn't all too, probably not that exciting, but um, I have figures which I haven't put here because I literally just got them yesterday. Um, the avocado, um, in 2010 they harvested, which is when they started with all these measures, they harvested 48,000 kilograms that went up until 2014 to 95,000, so nearly doubled. Orange, in 2010, 17,000 kilograms. In 2014, 49, nearly 50,000 kilograms. Pomegranate, 2012, that's uh, um, started only a few, few years ago with it. So it was 12,000 kilogram yield in 2014, 65,000 kilogram that went up steeply, partly because the trees were still young and they were growing themselves. Um, kumquats in 2010, 780 kilograms in 2014, 1,680 kilograms, so doubled as well, which I think is pretty impressive. Um, as a conclusion, I would say the SAFA tool shows an important degree of sustainability on this polygon plot. In this particular case study, 
It's an accessible tool. Everyone can use it. It's open source and it covers um, the main sustainab sustainability topics that are relevant to permaculture as well. It's fairly easy to use. The drawback probably is still that it's mainly qualitative, so it doesn't evaluate the practices per se in putting them into figures, which means doing experiments probably over a longer period of time. But I think, do think it is a nice tool to get the first impression of the farm and also to start bridging the gap towards government because you're using a tool that's internationally accepted. So um, my thanks at this point also go to um, Manolo um, Baez Lozano and his wife Isabel, the farm manager, who's sitting here in the front row. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias, Manolo. <laughs> I, was, I was very well welcomed on the farm and they helped me a lot to find my way around. Also the thanks go to the rest of the team who are really doing very hard work uh, under very, very hot conditions. Um, also, thanks again to Friedrich Lehmann um, and uh, Ralf Kennerknecht, who is also in the management of uh, the company called Lehmann Natur. Um, yeah, Juan Jose, uh, thanks to him, we have these beautiful drone pictures. And uh, Sarah Bubi from the group at CORE, at the center. Um, yeah, and... Uh, oh, Marion, you were on there. Yeah, Marion Bull, I was on there. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you very much, project man manager to uh, Lehmann de Tour, who has also been a uh, great help to aid this process of being able to get to the farm. So, thank you. Ah, yeah, project manager in charge of permaculture. That's very important. So, there is really a, a commitment by Lehmann Natur to permaculture and to con con convert existing uh, farms to permaculture systems, which is really a challenge, but they're investing a lot into it. And they're really, really doing what they can to, to make this happen. So thank you very much. So, mm. Now time for questions or comments. Uh, hi. Uh, is that working? Oh, yeah, there we go. Um, we were also looking at um, a number of different frameworks um, with Coventry University at CORE and um, the Permaculture Association. Um, and SAFA, the SAFA framework was one of 15 to 20 that we did a literature review on. And it's really interesting to hear you talk about it being uh, a self-assessment tool because we assessed that it was far from being a self-assessment tool and that perhaps it wasn't appropriate for smallholders because it's extremely lengthy and complex. Um, so as you actually used the tool, I was fascinated to hear you say those things about it. Could you talk a little bit about why you think it is a good self-assessment tool. Why? I mean, from our perspective, it would be a tool that the FAO would send an expert in to use. You are an academic and you used it on a farm. Do you actually think that the, the, the uh, not just the farm that you worked on, but also a smaller scale farm would be able to use the framework in the same way? Well, <clears throat> um, I think that the questions are, are easy to understand to the farmer um, and, and he can work with that framework. Now, having somebody external doing the assessment has the advantage that it's probably not as biased and there's somebody to, to discuss with. And actually, I found it very useful to discuss things with Manolo face to face because um, some things we, we had to discuss. How, how is it really? So, um, in theory, yes, I think a farmer could work with that um, because 
the questions are understandable. They, I mean, they're written in English, and and it's <laughs> it's it's not not really much jargon, I find. But to be honest, I haven't I haven't tested that part of it as. I mean, maybe there are uh, some amongst you who would say, okay, I'll, I'll take up that challenge and please send me the questionnaire. I'll see what I can do with it, if I can work with it, and then we, we can discuss, uh, uh, that person can discuss things with me. And uh, if I can't solve the problem, maybe I can hand it over to, to Nadia, uh, who developed this uh, system, and to FAO. I, it's a follow-on to that, actually, because at 116 questions, even if they're very simple and easy, and e easy to understand, I don't want to fill in 116 questions, um, and I'm really nerdy and into this stuff. So, um, is there a Safa light, or yeah. Yeah. could you, yeah. from yeah. your experience, say about how much time it took people to engage in this, and whether you saw opportunities to kind of pare it down a bit. Mm -hmm. Well, there actually, that, that was one of the criticisms when the SAFA tool was first launched, that it's not really fit for uh, small enterprises. And that's why FAO developed a small app or a small SAFA tool, um, which I've also tried. It's only 100 questions. <laughs> Um, there, it's more like ticking boxes, so it's it's, it's probably easier. Um, again, my feeling was, and that was also Manolo's, that um, the the large tool is more for really big companies, and the small tool is for uh, probably more. Um, what, how family-owned farms, probably more in the global south, um, where you would have a question like, uh, have all the members of the farm been able to have uh, three meals a day during the past whatever months or so? So some of the topics are not really relevant to Spain, where people usually still have plenty of food, thank God. Um, so, I think what one can say is it's a good starting point and the tool needs to be developed and adapted to permaculture and that surely is, is uh, something I would love to do and uh, I would also invite others amongst you to, to co-develop that. Hi, just one quick question. Did the, you, Manolo may be able to answer this as well as you, but did it make the farm more profitable? Because in terms of rolling it out to other commercial size farms, that's going to be the key driver. Sorry, but what, what's the, what is the question? Did the farm make more money as a result of changing to permaculture? Yes. Yes, okay. it did. I, di I didn't get to see the figures, but um, I, that's what I was told, that it did. And uh, the company is actually investing a lot of money into um, converting other farms that belong to them to permaculture and to get other subcontracted farmers to do the same. So, um, yes, I, I, I do... Uh, take it that there is an economic benefit. Just a short reaction to it. I'm working with farmers in France uh, on participatory research, and these farmers do uh, make some measurements on their farm and assess its viability. And each time we come as scientists to ask them about their results, the fact that they are implementing these measurements, they take distance, and it's kind of uh, make them really um, make effort to because they want to. To, to have better results when the scientists come. It's a, so, no, but just, you know, the fact of measuring things and assessing yourself, you, you take a distance and you can see really better with a accu more accurate uh, look where you have uh, things to, to improve. 
So, one last so, so what, what's the actual question to that? It's just a reaction. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, just sorry, another one question from again from the online community, um, uh, Mull Farm from Kuwait. Um, just wants to know: Is there uh, trade-offs um, as they tr transition to a per for be become f fully permaculture? Um, at all for these commercial it, farmers? Is there a trade-off? Yeah. Well, I think um, there's a lot of experiments going on the, on the farm and some experiments don't go the way you expected and some investments may have gone the wrong, you know, it may not lead to what you hope for. Um, so it really um, is thanks to, to probably the, 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 the way the company is set up that they have um, enough financial means to buffer uh, things when they don't go the way really they want it. So um, this like space for being able to experiment and not uh, go bankrupt because one experiment didn't work out, uh, that is important. But I think um, this can also be done on a smaller scale because your experiments can be on a smaller scale and you can still experiment. And if it doesn't go well, it's not going to be dramatic. Thank you. Yes. As a strategy for farms that convert to permaculture is not to convert everything, but to make s trial plots and to try because every farm is different, every place is different, so you have to make trials. Sorry, we, we need to switch to the third presentation. Mm -hmm.